put that in. And that's how it goes. All so right. I'll probably just I'll fade into this episode. Hello, everybody. Hi. Hey, it's Bad Philosophy. I'm your host, Stephen Torrance, and this is Mark Powell. Why don't you introduce yourself, Mark? I'm here. Free, free beer. Some chocolate stuff, yeah. some coffee, and free water, which is, uh, what do they say? The World Bank said uh, the next world war will be about water. Whoa. So, world Bank said that. When? IMF. IMF said that. Yeah. yeah. One of them said that. Uh, I think it was early. Like, oh, you sure it was Davos? I don't Maybe know. I saw it as a quote on a um, Beehive Collective oh. um, um, banner. Huh. I think it was IMF or World Bank. I always mix those two up. Mm. Hello, I'm Mark Powell. I'm here today with Stephen Torrance to talk about philosophy. Now, philosophy comes from the word... Okay, I don't really care about philosophy. <laughs> it comes from the word philosophical. Not, it's a neither do we. <laughs> you know, I, I, I was wondering the other night with a, uh, another friend of mine whether philosopher as a word was mm. actually derogatory initially. Mm. Mm. Because wasn't sophistry kind of uh, mm-hmm. panned in Greece? Yeah, it kind of, I think there's a valid... To call someone a sophist was like, kind of, a, a, you know, to put them down, like, oh, you're right. like a jabber, jabber right. or something. Right. Uh, or you're right. like a bullshit artist. Right. And to call them a lover of, of bullshit, bullshit artistry was like... Mm-hmm. Well, we can say, I, I, was, further, yeah. I was reading this, um, that Heidegger thing I sent you last night, and mm-hmm. he was saying that, um, that uh, you know... Heidegger was the opposite of sophistry philosophy, the idea that you observe thinking. He's saying you have to be the thinker to, do, to observe the thinking. Mm-hmm. Right? And so that's the worst part about philosophy or sophistry is it's detached from actual existence. Gotcha. But, uh, you know, maybe, maybe Love today. Heidegger. Maybe today we can fix that. Oh, man. that's That would be a hell of an accomplishment. Philosophy comes from the word philosophical, of course. Right. Which, is, uh, for, which means know thyself magically. Mm. It's like a magical... I believe I believe uh, Socrates said that, right? Yeah, I think so. He was yeah, a, he, was one of those he was magicians. a philosopher, wasn't he? He was. He yeah, was a, he was a philosopher <laughs> and, a, and a magician. This is as, this is how far we've come in in eight, seven, eight years of recording the show. Is just yeah. we're still as bad as the first day, and probably worse. <laughs> just have a little shout out for anarcho-syndicalism, baby. It's gonna be hard. You know, you might as well just like hold it up at the right angle because this this light like casts. Oh. The shadow of exactly the drawing that you have on. I was looking through my philosopher's notebooks, mm. which is uh, when I write concepts like sequential time and singularity and cosmic riddle. I try and condense people's ideas into cartoons so that I can easily pass them off to my friends. So I had Fuck yeah. Slaughter Deep One, this is my friend Jeremy, who believes the singularity already happened. Ah. And that uh, we've had a factory producing sequential time, and now the factory is pretending to produce sequential time. But that's the cosmic riddle, is we have to let everyone know on our side, that the singularity happened for us, not for them. Well, that okay. sounds a little bit like the premise of uh, William Gibson's latest. Oh, really? Yeah. Have you Have you read? I haven't. Uh, the Peripheral. Mm-mm. And it's kind of a. It's It's just done as a prologue to the story that he weaves. But anywho, yeah, uh, yeah like the singularity is running off some server in, in China. Nobody really knows. <laughs> Time split at some point, and yeah, exactly. realities loop back on each other. To, to step back very briefly, because yeah, sure. you're an extremely interesting person oh, to me, Mark. You are. To me. Yeah. Um, probably to a lot of people, but um, I fancy myself, period. But I also fancy myself as <laughs> someone who can, like, pick out unique individuals. Okay. Distinctive individuals. I'm probably not as good as it is as I think I am, mm-hmm. but generally we've had a lot of distinctive individuals on Bad mm-hmm. Philosophy over the years. Yeah. And uh, you're pretty up there. So you're a poet. Oh. You're you've also written viruses for the iPhone. That's right. You've done you've cooked with world class chefs. Mm-hmm. You've traveled pretty much everywhere. Oh yeah. And uh, everywhere white people are allowed to go has been. Yeah, you've gentrified much. everywhere you've lived, as you as you like <laughs> to say. That's true. Can we actually can we kick off the, the episode with a poem of yours? Would, do you have can you, can you, like, do kind um, yeah, of like, yeah. I just came back from San Francisco, and um, in, invocation, convocation. What do you call that? <clears throat> uh, yeah, an invocation. I, I feel like uh, I just came back from San Francisco. A little bit about the virus stuff, and so I've been vacationing here in Austin for five months, uh, relaxing from the class war that's mm. under that's under uh, underway in San Francisco. Of the kind of dot com techies taking over, um, uh, taking over. Uh, you know, taking over. Yeah, well, taking over San Francisco. Taking over everything they can. Yeah, it's a it's a very thing. And so Oh, I mean, I'm sorry, disrupting. 
Disrupting. Innovating. Right, right, right. Yeah. yeah, disrupting is how Texas State take over. Is it and cool so, that we're like, we're sort of blaspheming? I guess I could read that. Yeah, For sure. Yeah. yeah, 100%. I think it's um, exactly where your words need to be. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I have a lot of anti-tech poetry. I have about two books worth of uh, anti-tech stuff. And then um, I just started writing anti-Texas stuff recently, too, which I was very excited about. Mm-hmm. But, oh, I, uh, should, I should say, when I mean center, we're recording in the um, hidden library room of Capital Factory in downtown yeah. Austin. Um, and which, thank you very much. And, 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 and Austin's like 10 years back from yeah. San Francisco. The sprawl is here. The yeah. sprawl is developing. People are still talking positively about entrepreneurship. And, um, you know, very few people are pointing out the colonizers in our midst. Very few mm-hmm. people are pointing out uh, the conquistadors wearing guayaberas, you know. The people yeah. who are, uh, here, so this is a little bit about, um, about San Francisco, uh, what's happening right now. San Francisco has changed, her 48 hills are now the seven pits of hell, and rarefied are the tops of these hell pit hills. Eccentric techie billionaires live far above us, the descendants of the dot-coms. They occupy their wizard towers among the clouds, they scrape the sky. They never leave their apartments. They only exist online because everything they could want is delivered to them. The skins of the homeless spider needles into powerful slingshots. They use them to deliver chewing gum and Xbox games to the nouveau riche man-child programmers in their 40th floor apartments. Their chariots run our children down in the streets. The billionaires are evicting the millionaires. This is decadent Rome times 100, and our new emperors strut their billions down Valencia Street like 12-year-old boys playing dress-up. And I'm guilty, too. I wrote viruses for the internet. Viruses to trap all of you through your phones. I helped the robot spiders draw this world into theirs. I wrote the software as sure as IBM built bitter, sold better machine guns for the mind and the computers to the Nazis. My hands are bloody, too. Oh, but there's community and positivity. California is co op Valley. California's utopia was turned into an app and exported. California's utopia was co-opted by robot prisons for the mind. And we can't even blame capitalism anymore. It probably goes back to mercantilism. Maybe even the baptism of the spectacle itself in those schisming church councils where they started to separate us from ourselves. They separated our mind from our minds. They pried apart our true connections and inserted a connection, a cell phone, a line of code, an app, a cable. Mediation takes command and we are all apps now. But thank God we're finally connected! More and more connections! Riddling our true souls like syphilitic lesions. We forget that we are forgetting. And reality is mediated through our phones. This invisible layer between us all, connecting us with exoneurotransmitters that vibrate in our pockets and harvest our thoughts, harvest our visions, harvest our children, harvest the skies, the internet. We fed them the planet. And in return, computers trapped our minds in bonsai cage prisons of entertainment. We are entertaining ourselves to death in this prison world full of phone calls and text messages. A prison that we love to help them weave because we love to stay connected. This prison is with us always, connecting us to the outside world. But it's just inches above our heads down attention. Because nothing is connected, but everything is networked. And nothing is connected. Intro to the, uh, the new piece. Snap, 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 snap. Intro to like the next uh, book of stuff, basically about mediation. How do you feel about that? Fuck Marshall McLuhan is how I feel. Oh about yeah, that's a good yeah. one too, man. I, so I went to San Francisco and I renegated this uh, fake TED talk. Uh, they had like some shitty colonizer community tech art space. Uh, no offense. Uh, <laughs> that's like right in the middle of the mission. It's like you know an old theater. That mm. The rents are going up around it, and um, and uh, they had um, art, like Eric, like a picture of Eric Schmidt. Painted in shit, called Eric Shit. 
Oh. That's nice. Wow. And because uh, it's like it's like basically fake transgress sucking dick or whatever it was. And there's some you know profane internet stuff. Oh, a of, right. A lot of stuff about NSA and um, Snowden and things like that. And they had a big fake TED talk where it was. But the best thing about it is it's so great. It was like seen and not heard. Everyone used it for selfies. They had like a headset you could put on, and you had a TED talk. And uh, but there was no amplification. You couldn't like give a TED talk. And so 150 people in the room. I uh, took it. I did a mic check and. Uh, Read uh, about five, six minutes of three pieces, including this one. And, wow. and, the, and the fuck Marshall McLuhan one is the start. Fuck Marshall McLuhan! Yeah. The media has made such a mess of this age. And uh, so I got to do that, which was awesome. And, and you know, being a loud person, uh, it was, you know, I was louder than the Dr. Dre beats next door. What kind of, what kind of reactions did you get? Um, yeah, well, I think half people in SF, I mean, some people in SF tech scene are very, very conflicted about it. I think that's, yeah. you know, people, you can hate capitalism and still be happy when you get money. You know, you could have contradictory thoughts in your head. You can hate technology and, and uh, still use it to express that thought. Mm. Um, so, yeah, there was some good reactions, I think. Yeah, people came up to me at the end and said that it was really cool. So, it, it, you know, wanted to get... Mm. Some people kind of wanted to co-opt it, like, can you come talk to this thing? And I want to put that in my basket. Right. Type, uh, which is why I try not to be online, which is why I try not to be, you know... Can, uh, can I ask you then how, how you feel about me inviting you to... Uh, to do your poetry at the uh, EFF Austin events. Does oh, that, it's been super great. That doesn't feel like co-opting. Uh, no, I don't think I usually get on. I don't think anyone watches it online. Or right. Like that. Yeah. I, think that, you know, I mean, you're right. It yeah. sucks, but you're right. <laughs> it's not like a TED Talk or a South by a thing. And, yeah. and it's honestly, the litmus test is my friend wants, my friend off has this opportunity, and it's been a great opportunity. Mm. So for the past uh, couple of months, I've just been going to the the meetups for EFF here, the blockchain, um, loose body cameras and digital archiving and then com taking notes, which is something I love to do. Mm -hmm. And then during the Q and A compose a poem about it, which is just a fun thing to do. And it's because it's very real in the moment and it kind of charts my changing of minds. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, Oh, do we need police body cameras or do we not? Is it good to use the police state tools against the police state or is it all just more police state shit? Mm -hmm. um, is it good to remember everything? Right. right. Is it is it good to save or should we yeah. let stuff go? And, and, yeah. and even more separately, is it good to ha let machines solve problems that we should be solving ourselves? It's right. like because we can't ban guns and take them away from cops. Uh, well, we need all this technology to make yeah. sure they don't fuck it up. So it's uh, so that's been that's been super great. Uh, not just meeting people there, but also just being able to. Uh, uh, I think language is a written, is a living thing, mm. and that literature, as, as Roland Barr says, the car literature is the carcass of language. Mm. And when you write something down in 1978, it's going to sound like a 1978 punk scene. Mm. You write something down in 2002, it's going to sound like you know the Bush it's years. Sound like 2002. Yeah, yeah, the Bush years revolt against Iraq. If you write something mm. down in 2000, you know, write let's sound like Occupy stuff. So, language is a living thing. Performing in front of a bunch of people, my pieces don't really come across well when they're written. I think there are things to try and write books, but the performance aspect is like the most important thing and being able to perform it um, at the EFF meetups is super great because it feels like it's a dialogue with the people in the room because I'm basically saying, hey, all that shit everyone just said, here you go. It's not yeah. like I'm saying, here's an episode of Game of Thrones that no one has any input on. It's not a uh, monodirectional, you know, it's, it's a, it's yeah. a two-way communication, at least multi-way communication because I'm picking up on things people say in the room. And mm -hmm. yeah, oh, and, and it, it, it astounded me many times who laughed at like, what in your poems afterward you know things that things that would be that would probably come off of yes you, but kind of in the context of this yeah. synthesis that you're performing honestly yeah. people dislike it's, that they're being paid attention to and um, so i might say something that is going against the morality that the digital archivist lady um you know maybe publicly presented mm -hmm. but if i'm if, but i care enough about the thing that she said to contradict her in a poetic way wow and help her try and think of something outside of that thing it was really fun it, with a room full of cops, too. Oh, was, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we did wear their guns in and all yeah, of it. Yeah, we all had guns. But I was like, oh, man, this is my only opportunity to speak to a power to a truth to a room full of cops. And yeah. Was really great. I'll, I'll hopefully, it will not be your last yeah. time. But, Mark, I'm curious. Would you call yourself a philosopher? Why or why not? I mean, I was raised <laughs> in, the, in the philosophical uh, tradition. My brother and my dad both have degrees in philosophy. We grew up with a lot of... Mm -hmm. I was raised in you know, existential atheists. And, um, uh, you know, I, I, the, thing I, the thing I don't like about philosophy is that it seems like it doesn't affect people's lives anymore. For the past four or 500 years, it doesn't really affect... Um, it doesn't really tell you how to live, mm -hmm. right? It tells you how to think about something. And um, 
So I, I, while I enjoyed reading it, I also never addiction to that specialized um, terminology, all the folk terms. Mm-hmm. I think I only read, I only learned like through that paper what existential really even means, <laughs> which is this uh, again, this opposite of being able to your existence is is you know it's not detachment, it's your existence from which you derive, you know, it's your everything uh, yeah. from which you derive your observations. It's not a detached thing. Like imagine a world where there's fire and it's hot. So logistically, all things mm-hmm. are hot that are fire. You know, it's, it's no, it's it's. Imagine I'm in a fire. Yeah, or, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that kind of a thing. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So I, I feel like woefully, you know, I have favorites, but uh, and I understand what the continental versus whatever. I can fake it out if you send me to a philosopher's sure. conference. Sure. You, you can bullshit with the best of them. Probably way yeah. better than I can. But, but yeah, am I a philosopher? Um, I would. I. Uh, I don't think I philosophize all the time. I mostly digest other people's philosophies and try and. Um, smelt them down into whatever I, uh, you know, I think you, it seems like you, you, different voices that I'm capable of yeah. and that would fit in their buckets. I don't think I'm necessarily creating anything new, but I am like collating. I was like, you're, you're, you're extruding or filtering them through your, through your, your particular brands mm-hmm. of poetry and, and yeah. comic and note taking and all that. Yes. Yeah. I'm trying so to just call yourself a poet. And yes, why I do write poetry, so yeah. I am a poet. Um, I don't think I write philosophy. I do think I seed myself with a lot of philosophy. And I think as, a, as an artist, you seed yourself. Um, uh, what is a good, a good Jodorowsky quote? He says, uh, art is something that, you know, friendship is the means that you create something together. Ooh. I like that a lot. So having just seen The Holy Mountain last night. Oh, time, yeah, what did you think of that? <laughs> uh, one of the things we like to do on the show. <clears throat> Yeah, what, man, my favorite part. Camera, zoom out. My my yeah. favorite part of that is the uh, is it the Venetian planet where they're making war to- war toys? Yeah. Is the Martian planet? Yeah, uh, no, 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 no. It was. I think uh, it was Venus. Is no, the, it was it was Saturn. Having Saturn, seen, you're right. Saturn. Yeah, Saturn. She, so so it goes through all the whole planet cosmo- cosmology, and then he's like, you yeah. know, on Saturn they have a factory where the government computer has figured out who you're going to be at war with when you're 18. <laughs> hey, we're going to be at war with Peru, so let's make Peruvian vilification toys. And I remember being a kid. Oh. And playing with G.I. Joe and hating the Cobra Law, which was like crazy guys in the desert who ululated. Oh. And then being like raised to, uh, then being raised to, uh, you know, go die in the desert in the 90s and the 2000s. Right. So uh, I think there's something to that. I think that there's a, uh, I wasn't so much into the Enneagram. Keep going. I'm just not seen it on acid. So how was that? Fool. <laughs> I mean, it, it felt like being on acid. Because uh, you used to not be able to get it. It used to be like uh, someone. It was back in the VHS culture, you know. Yeah. You had to be able to get it because it wasn't. Uh, oh, not distributed. This, yeah. It was, yeah, it wasn't distributed. Uh, it, a pirated version I, of it. I, I, I looked up all the tri- like it was one of the last movies that uh, John Lennon and Yoko Ono right. saw before he was shot. Like, right. A few days before. Although my other favorite part of it is <laughs> this: mo- nothing in your education could have prepared you for the Holy Mountain. This yes. movie is beyond critique. And it's like, oh, okay. I guess yeah. I won't <laughs> critique it then. All right. But it's I, a different art form, 100%. Oh, yeah. for sure. And, and Jodorowsky is a, is a different soul, which we should do an entire episode on him sometime. She should get um, him in there. Yeah. Uh, uh, no. <laughs> no, Are you a philosopher? No, 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 no. Are you a philosopher? Yeah. Yeah. I would say I philosophize a lot okay. more. And I think as the years have gone on, I'm less and less inclined to call myself a philosopher. Hmm. Because oh. it, it does, it, you know, it's, it's the, you talk about the Illich thing of nouns and verbs. Right. Yes. Um, and that we're moving from a, a verb culture to a noun culture. Right. We're, we're right. sort of like making static and commodifying ideas. Right. And yeah. We're, we're consuming nouns instead of being a verb, and it's very Zen too. Right. It's very like, are you moving from flow to to point? You know, uh, to, to to yeah. I would just say like, make a list of the verbs that you do all the time, and that's what you are. And I try to do that every couple of months in my little zines and stuff. Is yeah. just like, what am I doing lately? If I'm not cooking lately, I'm not a cook. You right, know, but I cooked this last weekend, and I did some dinners at friends' houses, and I am a cook right now. So and it's fucking lovely. Yeah, this there you go, and and I think uh, as I as I sort of loop back around into Taoism, and move <laughs> through the into Taoism. well, these nice. the, these <laughs> what is it? Down. Time time is a flat circle, and mm-hmm. uh, all that. Um, the theory of the Mobius. I'm finding. I'm, you know, you, you always, whenever you look at intervening experience, right? Yeah. All the interstitial uh, stuff you've picked up. And it, it doesn't look the same. It, it does and it doesn't. I don't know why this is. These, the cheap, the, the free pens at the, at the Capital Factory, I do not recommend. This is actually the pen that I brought with me, oh, okay. so fuck you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Bullshit! Yeah, I would just say, uh, you know, kind of going back to the seating Works things. Works on here. Um, yeah. the problem is. It might be the paper. There we so go. So anyway, 
Um, well, okay. So we'll an, back an, into Taoism. Another question. So it, it's the questioning part. So th- this is like, okay, here we are stepping back a little bit. I'm like interviewing you. Okay. Yeah. We're creating interesting dialogue here. Sure. And well, I've often like? wondered if the if the question mark is a hook. I'm sure it comes from that like symbolic lineage, and you're, mm-hmm. you're just. I always think of it as like I'm just like drawing things out sure. with questions sure. and just put, tossing them up in the air or right, right. mixing them up or whatever. Um, I feel like that is more intimately linked to the to, to the, the doing of philosophy mm. than um, sure. than the anything else. Yeah, yeah. I read and that's a, that's maybe Socratic. But I read a lot of Socrates for that too. Yeah, it's well, very. He always seems to have an agenda with it. Mm-hmm. I don't know if I ever have so much of an, an overt agenda. Right. Well, I think his agenda is like uh, is creating inference as a as a as a as a, as a tool for philosophical. Like, oh, well, do you think of this? Do you think of this? It's like yeah, right. He's helping you narrow all that stuff down. Mm-hmm. If you say this, well, then I can infer that this thing is true. Do you still say this? Does he do it um, convergingly or divergingly? Yeah, I don't know what that means. Like, is he? He he does seem like he's trying to. Oh, yeah. he's use the questions to yeah. guide you towards 100%. something. Yeah, which is a way, right? Which I, mm-hmm. I tend to prefer the kind of questioning yeah. that like broadens, right? Yeah. Um, I don't do it particularly well. All the right. Time, but yeah, I had this zine I'm working on. This is like um, yeah. big questions, and so I made this list of questions I want to answer. Things like, um, should I vote? Mm. And I want to answer at the end of the zine, yes or no. And I answer it by going through all the philosophers that I think have something to say about it. And having a little sketch of them and a quote about them from their writing, mm-hmm. uh, and asking them a little sub question, so that eventually I get to the big question. Right. Right. So you have a question about uh, you know, should there be you know should should there be universal abundance? Mm. Right. Mm. Yes or no. And this is the idea of progress is that uh, that I've been you know really against lately um, in terms of this is really my the philosophical bu- philosophical bucket I'm in of anti growth or anti progress mm. or more just like pro-populism or pro-limits, like I'm trying to help bring around, bring about the age of limits. Mm. Human wants are insatiable, and as soon as new, as the old ones are satisfied, new ones appear, and that this increases everyone's level of comfort and will indefinitely expand forever, all productive forces, and that is basically this, this revolution of rising expectations mm. that's supposed to increase productive forces forever, and the planet can't sustain it but no one's talking about that everyone's just like everyone in the, the court room is saying oh well you don't want to you know we, we have to have this law it can't interfere with uh you know in, you know entrepreneurship yeah or, or you know the, you know the government wants to teach people entrepreneurship in schools we want to have more iphones in africa we want to, everyone needs to be rich the prosperity gospel all this shit right and so it's like uh you know, that idea, is that sustainable now? Why are we going in that direction? So, so why sustainable? Survival of the human race, I guess. Well, two, two reasons. Should we? Do two you reasons. really believe we should stick around? Two reasons. One, survival. Two, morally, it was, like, wrong to want excess 200, 300 years ago. And now it's mm-hmm. right. Now it's because it helps the economy. The economy, which was not, a, not an idea either until recently. You know, I mean, it all changed into different things. But the idea that, you know, Adam Smith was saying, if you, uh, you know, if you... Thrift is bad. Mm. He's basically saying that uh, you know you shouldn't be thrifty because don't you want to help the economy? It's the spending that that creates these things. Mm. And so that's a huge moral shift from the morality of the lower class to the morality of the upper class, and really the democratization of luxury. Talk about the democratization mm. of consumption. For now, we all get that fucking champagne. Everyone's just like, that's their evidence for progress is good. Right. It's like I get to drink the fucking champagne now that my grandparents never could have had. Right. There's truffle oil on the fucking shelf. Clearly, we are doing great. Yes. And it's like... Um, We're all kings. It's cool. wonderful. Yeah. Yeah, but what about the sea levels? Yeah, but what about our moral uh, fiber? What about being able to deal with uh, things like scarcity? Mm. Well, that, that's atrophying. So, so John, John Michael Greer, who I have been reading a ton of lately, the, uh, talks about it as... The Archdruid. Right. He talks about this as kind of the unacknowledged religion of our mm-hmm. current age. Yes, yes. Right? And that, yeah. that belief in progress is like belief in God or mm-hmm. belief in mm-hmm. Zeus or belief mm-hmm. in Rama or what, any of these, right. these belief systems that if you were to go back to any of right. those civilizations and ask them, what, so what religion are you? They'd be mm-hmm. like, uh, I don't know what you mean. Right. You know, but uh, man, Zeus is angry today. We've been getting a bunch of rain. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. and that that kind of a thing. I live and die for Zeus, <laughs> right? And for Rome. And to to question that in that context right. would yeah, they either get you killed or exiled or worse. You know, yeah, you know? it's um, it's the dominant. Uh, yeah, it sounds like I really got to read that. But for us to believe that. now that we've sort of like transcended religion in some way, which yeah. I hear with complete sincerity mm-hmm. from mm-hmm. many people around me um, who I consider to be well educated, it's I mean, it's kind of funny. 
I, I don't know. There, there's also the Didn't sort of... Didn't that happen in the 1800s? Isn't that Nietzsche's whole thing of uh, God is dead and we killed him? I mean, isn't that... Mm. Um, it, yeah, I, don't, I think that maybe that's true, maybe it's not. But I think from, from if you step back and say that there is a fucking uh, biological life cycle that is mm. being... Totalizations are born, right? Yep. And then they mature, and then they get old, they have senescence, and then they die, right? And that's how everything always fucking works. And now, instead, it's immortal. Yeah. Because science is immortal, it's, civilizations are immortal. It's instead of instead of a nice yeah. life cycle. Yeah, the it's, biological life cycle is just we're just we're just going, 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 going. Asymptotic you know? line towards nuclear annihilation or anarchist utopia. Right. But uh, you know, so, so that's that's really the, the the thing about this religion that's been created is progress. Uh, science. So scientism mm -hmm. to to distinguish from science. Sure. Um, sure. I, I heard an, an excellent. Uh, articulation of this recently on the Buddhist Geeks podcast. I'll link that in the show notes. Um, that scientism is another way to call this sort of religion of our age. You know, you watch, I, I watched um, Neil deGrasse Tyson on Charlie right. Rose the other night, and every time he said science or the universe, I just replaced it with, with God or Christian, right, with right, Christianity right. or God, right, respectively. Yeah. And you, you listen to the to the reverence in his voice for the, and the way he speaks, and it's like, he, he's this He's this high priest of the of the scientific faith. Yeah. Not that he is a scientist, yeah. which yeah. he might well be, but it's it's the other dimension of it. It's, right. it's like the, the spiritual dimension of science. I think it's Chodorowsky right. said that scientists don't um, don't believe in anything, but they believe in one thing. They believe in not believing in anything. Right. <laughs> right. So that's <laughs> and it's not atheism. I mean, it's it's you know Dawkins kind of articulated. It, it's more atheism might be the uh, let's say the, the the extremist view, right? The, the yeah. uh, uh, what is it, the uh, evangelical, you know, sure. dimension of this, whereas um, Neil deGrasse Tyson's may be more the, you know, born again, or, and yeah, like, right, the, <laughs> the more, yeah, the more palatable, that's what you're saying, right, secular Unitarian, but, but how, how would we, um, you know, you, you question Neil deGrasse Tyson, and in most circles on the internet, you're going to get just flamed out the wazoo, sure. right, Weird. <laughs> it's, it's funny, right, yeah, like, that's his, that's his cathedral, that's his, uh, it is. his, uh, Congregation is the internet. Mm -hmm. So we, we, we have these cycles that we go through. And to go back to Greer, he's like, let's look at history. Let's look we, how humanity's been. We rise and fall. We, we do these things. We, right. All civilizations have done these things. Right. And for us to believe that we're different is is this like kind of core egoism yeah, of sure. our age, sure. right? Sure, sure. That, that this, this time it's going to be... This yeah. time it's different. This time and in many ways it forever. is, right? <laughs> but it? it's, the la it's the oldest story, right? Yeah. Facing... The fountain of youth. Do you think we're just afraid of death? As a, I mean, I think we, <laughs> we had the whole Thanatos Euros thing. I mean, it seems like it's going to last forever, but we just had a, another millennial flood this weekend in Austin. Mm -hmm. uh, the big one's coming anytime in California. I mean, we're using that's water use that's doing that, right? I mean, it's it's uh, you know, we are changing the uh, the earth, and that's ourselves. But, you know, we are, as we push it away, as we try to push it away, and and make green lawns and things like that. I feel like. Um, yeah, the scientism thing is interesting because it's a. Uh, I wasn't personally raised any religion, so mm -hmm. I don't really have all that uh, anti-religion stuff. That uh, in fact, a great quote I have is that spiritual desiccation is a much worse force for humanity than mm -hmm. any than all uh, religious bigotry and intolerance and uh, atrocities combined. You think we're pretty desiccated these days? Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. Our mythologies, we we uh, you know industrial capitalism, the mode of production of industrial capitalism removed all authorities removed all mythologies. We don't have those in common. Think of what you have in common with your parents now. Do you believe in the same God as your parents? Do you have the same values as your parents? Do you live with your parents? That's like, you know, maybe that's patriarchal. Maybe that's fucked up. But it's like, that is a connection to the past. Mm. And all that has been severed. And our, and our big mythology vacuum has been replaced by TV. You think about a rich family, like the Kennedys, and think, they have a family mythology. You say, oh, your Uncle Jack, your Uncle Teddy, like mm. whatever. There's a mythology that you learn. And that's your family mythology. And for lower class people um, um, who are working all the time to survive and are watching TVs and apps, that's their mythology. Is the right. Cardassians, the Kanyes, these have come in. Pagan idols have come in and replaced, you know, the real pagan idols. Uh, and that's, um, yeah, that's 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 the issue that I think has happened in terms of uh, our desiccation, our spiritual desiccation. Is also morally, we are not. You know, we are in the wrong path. We are worshiping abundance instead of worshiping frugalness, or you know, instead of expressing ourselves with frugalness. Mm. And so that's just you know, 
that's a uh, more, more, more. It's like being addicted to heroin. It's like you have to have more, have it to is. have more. I, I'll throw what in. Yeah, Masanobu. Um, yeah, just and and it's it's actually From uh, the one star revolution, right? Right, and I, I um, gosh, I wish I could I could pull out a quote from him, uh, but this this is from Wendell Berry's uh, preface to the book. I mean, Fukuoka. He'll just be going along about rice and then say something yeah. so profound. Yeah. His, his whole, what started off his whole thing um, right. was just a kind of a nihilism, like a deep nihilism and meaninglessness that mm. he, he felt in a, in a glimpse by the water, right. uh, which got him doing his kind of hands-off farming technique. Mm -hmm. But um, a lot of other things flow from it. Here's right. what Barry saw in it. It, it evoked some uh, words worth for him. Our meddling to murder, to dissect. Murder I think we're, dissect. I we're like pretty that. murderous murderous culture these days, you know? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that. We murder to dissect. So it, it's it's sort of in this process that, you know, science... God damn it. <laughs> try kind of angles and slowness. Oh, well, there you go. We murder to dissect. We murder to dissect. Um, it dovetails with... I've been reading a lot of Ian McGilchrist late, lately, mm -hmm. the, um, you know, over-favoring of... Um, Particularization and reductionism right. within our, our cultural intellect. You know, you can almost think of like Gaia as being schizophrenic lately, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and these sorts of um, these sorts of patterns of the mind that that you know that like to detach, reduce, right, right, um, right. separate, and you know, like you're describing the family thing. You know what I, I try to think of what I have in common with many children these days. You know, mm -hmm. if I haven't kept up with every Tumblr yeah. feed everywhere or BuzzFeed or HuffPo, or, right. you know, know your meme. If yeah. I don't have that like at at my beck and call, right, right. it's gonna be very hard for me to like relate on anything right. of, a, of a terribly yeah. high level. Like we can relate on maybe food and music and a few sure. things maybe, but sure. you know, it's about it's about how we distend and then we influence and rebel against each other. Mm -hmm. And if we hit each other as two triangles, we would influence and distend our little triangle into a different, mm -hmm. you know, an acute triangle or an obtuse triangle. If we hit it a vertex, we would create a new concept and make another vertex. Well, and after that level, so then we become multi, you know, you know two-dimensional, different vertices, polytopes, basically polygons. Hmm. And then if you hit another time at the, at the vertex, you would get an axis. And then you, I would become a 3D, you would become a 2D, or we would both become 3D. And then we could, inter, we could intersect uh, with other polytopes over the network. And you could seed it with, like, your music collection. So hmm. I'm seeded with Pink Floyd. Therefore, I'm going to have axes that are... I watched every Simpsons episode, so I would match with them. And so as you create, as you combine, you may totally miss people because you don't even exist on the axes that you're on. But as you create, uh, as you collide and create a new lexical concept, like for example, right now we're talking about um, you know philosophy or life cycle or whatever, yeah. that gets created, and then we then we just shoot copies of ourselves off back into the world and try and intersect with all the other people, all the other dialogues. You know, you're getting into this eco dialogue, yeah. you have this Texan dialogue, you have this entrepreneur dialogue, this uh, archivist dialogue. That's the gift of our generation, you know, and kind of including you in our generation, is that you know the political activists of the '60s and the '70s. There's this thing called progressive fusionism and and, and uh, conservative fusionism that happened. Where basically, uh, never heard of it. Huge political thing in the '70s. Mm. There was the technology was mailing lists, and uh, basically the Republican Party for the Reagan Revolution got all of the religious conservatives, military conservatives, social conservatives. Uh, I think I may have already said religious conservatives, <laughs> farmer conservatives, all of them together, mm. gun gun conservatives, and shared their mailing lists. It was called conservative fusionism. They basically fused the, the the platform of the Republican Party to include all of those. So the purpose it's happening, it's happening now. Oh. It's, it's, it's happening thirty years later because you have our four forebears who came out of. I mean, you, you see people like John Lenkowski and all that stuff. It's like yeah. they speak one dialogue, and it's it's one dialect. It's great though because you have all these activists from the sixties and seventies, people like Maggie, who are like um, not that they were around then or like active yeah. then, but it's like people from that older generation are civil rights activists, hmm. gay rights activists. Civil, uh, digital civil rights activists, right? Um, environmental activists, uh, you know, women's rights activists, things like that. And so our job is progressive fusionism, which is being able to speak multiple languages, be able to mm. speak to tech, be able to speak to politics, be able to speak to environment, be able to speak to whatever. Hmm. And so that's that's a progressive fusionism that's supposed to be happening Interesting. right now or within the past ten years. So you had you have written. I I hope it is. I really do. Uh, if if we're truly facing the, the kind of things that science, <laughs> as you know, love it or hate it, it's here, um, mm -hmm. indicates that we might be as a planet and as a species. It's going to take a lot of collective action 
rowing in the same direction, potentially, to change things. Maybe. According to some. I, I will throw in... A, so he, David Holmgren and Bill Mollison were, were two of the progenitors of permaculture. Uh, I have his Mollison book here. Holmgren expanded the idea of building ecologically um, synergistic, uh, sustainable human settlements sure. uh, with agriculture uh, to a broader sense of permanent culture, of, mm -hmm. of building sustainable human mm -hmm. culture. Right. And Holmgren said, and, and Mollison came from the same direction, which were, you know, they were doing very top-down activism, you know, really pushing at, you know, UN and government and trying right, to get right, these reforms. Right. They just burned out on it. Yeah. And we're like, well, let's try it from the other direction. Mm -hmm. Let's just go and build the, the thing that we want and live in it right. and live as an example. Right Now, obviously, your farm that you've done all the permaculture stuff in the world on, it makes no difference if the guy next to you is super NRA gun rights guy burning diesel all the time. The one straw revolution, it does make a difference. Right? One but straw it begins makes a difference. To, yeah, it it sure. begins to tip things, right? Mm -hmm. so, so there's... It makes sense in those people's lives. Because right. it shows another way of being, like what 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 sort of a, is the the way the verbing of the because difference? over here you have an individual human, mm -hmm. and over here you have this trick of humanity. Right? Mm. And if you have the scales here are, uh, sorry everybody, humanity needs to uh, play Xbox. Yeah. <laughs> or you have hey. You know, I'm a couple people over thing. here. Yeah. Not necessarily that it's your most important thing, but the human experience of two people toiling on the soil and dying are relating to each other. Mm. And not necessarily inflicting it on the rest of the world, but what does Illich say? He says, as soon as you start talking about, um, you know, the whole of humanity, you've basically, the whole of the earth, you've basically totally thrown away what it is to be an individual human. Whoa. In your existence. And you're basically, you have this other religion that you're setting up. But, uh, you know, which is that, ah, humanity wants this. Ah, uh, for the good of humanity. That's what we're doing. It's the responsibility of saving the planet. But, as opposed to uh, but having the, a direct the heap, relationship. The heap is the sum of a bunch of grains. Right? Sure, yeah. Um, but, when, I mean, pay does, attention to your grain. What's, uh, we uh, talked about it in an uh, interstitial episode, the, the last rule set update. But this is kind of the, what's tipped within me is what you're talking about here is a, is a whole different Look, kind of meaning making yes. for an individual then we're generally um, we're generally tilted toward. Yeah. Right. Sure. It's a. <sighs> I would say that's mediation. That's like hmm. the whole the whole. Uh, I mean, you know, I, I'm not Christian, but I've you know read the Gospels and things like that. And the whole idea of what Christ's message is is this idea that uh, you have a direct relationship with the divine, hmm. right? If you look at the uh, Palestinian, find the dead Jew or you know almost dying Jew in the. Uh, in the, in the side of the gutter, puts up in a hotel, says, you know, please take care of him, et cetera, et cetera. He turned away from his whole tribe mm. and had a direct relationship with another human. Mm. And that's unmediated reality. And then here comes the Catholic Church to corrupt that Ooh. because that's what, that's what Christ is supposed to make possible is a human relationship that made possible the Antichrist, which is, hey, we'll do that for you. Hey, tie yeah, it to yeah. us and we'll do charity. And then right, you right, have right. this giant real estate company that comes And now up. Starbucks. Yeah, hey, so just, I think you know, buy this latte and we'll totally take care of the Africa thing that makes you feel guilty, right? Like uh -huh. it's yeah. Whereas there's people sitting on the bench out front, you know, in this fucking storm, right? Of this house, what are we doing for them? I mean, you just gotta touch those people anyway. Make eye contact, and uh, I think it's anyway. Back to your yeah. Well, it's it, it's another it's another way of coming at the abstraction. I don't yeah. know. There's there's really no back to anything. We we like to yeah. we like to loop around and sure. Uh, it, it's it's a uh, very rhizomatic. I guess this this mm -hmm. discussion mm -hmm. this this reality, which is part of I don't know that 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 too is um, there are goods good and bad ways of using that approach. Mm -hmm. I think the uh, so far as it will be for a lot of people who don't mm -hmm. intersect with our planes of eminence in the you know the reason Bukhari sense who maybe don't share some of the same experiences mm -hmm. we have mm -hmm. um, can use... can be alienating. Right, and that's that yeah. seems to be in some ways the nature yeah, of, but, uh, of, of the, the story, the humanity story. Right, right, right. Well, the opposite is the lowest common denominator. You use a lot of fifty cent words that I don't understand. The law, you're like, you know, in this sense, and I'm like, 
what does that mean? Et right. Cetera. People view it, won't necessarily get that. But so um, where does that where where does that line right? Like what's a, is is that always fine. a negotiation? Roland Barthes. Uh, it doesn't matter. It, Roland Barthes has never apologized, never explained. Yeah. It's just you know, do you want to you know, do you want to watch third grade programming where people are uh, explaining? Here's what this means. Right. Or do you want to hear? Like and, I like to do, I read a book and I read, they make some references to some other book that I've never heard of and I just go get it. And, and I'll be like, if you're in listening to this and going, man, I don't understand. Or mm -hmm. if you, you know, already tuned out, you won't even hear this. But if you have questions about this, totally ask us and yeah. totally like have Google what? open. What, what do you think? Okay. Let's project. What are some <laughs> questions that people would ask about this? I don't know. Why are these two white guys telling us what to think about the world? Right. That could be one. Um, uh, because we have the privilege of computer space. We have this $250 a month uh, incubator space access to that. Uh, we're on the tallest building in the middle of Austin. We are the eye of Sauron for gentrification of mm -hmm. Austin is why. Uh, we were both born uh, white privileged and had access to technology and are able to sit around and not uh, get calluses on our hands except from tapping iPads. I've begun to callus a little bit as I um, start to work in the ground a bit more. Oh, I that's know. lovely. I know, it's like, it's so, sorry to be the that's exception. That's lovely. No, 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 I have a poem, <laughs> have a poem for you. Yeah. Called, Friends are the opposite of apps. Okay. I need you, my friend. Like I needed my phone before I smashed it and mailed it back to the NSA full of narcware. At least when my friends narc on me on Facebook, it's because they love me, or because they secretly hate me, or they secretly something me. Because friends don't collate friends. Friends don't dump friends into Rolodex filing cabinet computer databases and let the machines figure it all out for us. How we feel about our friends. How long is too long to go without calling our friends, without clicking on our friends. But you are my friend. And our friendship is like a garden, and it's planting season. And our tools are rotting away in the yard, and the compost pile needs to be turned. And outside is calling. The land screams for your tears and blood instead of Farmville. 14 hours a day, stealing your tears, building up fake calluses of labor on your tippy-tappy-tippy-tappy fingers. Friend, it is time for your fingers to bleed. Friend, come outside with me and dig in this earth. Let's void the earth's warranty. Friend, let's smash our phones and show the fucking Illuminati where they can shove their fucking apps right up their fucking ass. It's a little bit the digging, the digging the, thing. The, the I thought you would be into the gardening, yeah, no, like uh, that, yeah. the gardening analogy. Thought you might be into that. Love it. So that's good. What are some other questions people would ask? Um, uh, I would say, is all science you, bad? Is all science bad? We've we've uh, we've definitely dove into that on other shows. I I, I don't think so. I, I think it's it is a tool, and I we have to remember that it's a tool mm -hmm. and not a not a. Um, yeah, I would say Silicon Valley funded science is bad when there's huge venture capital firms. And yeah. I think like uh, if science is bad, I don't know. I didn't see any other shows, but I feel this way. I feel about it is I thought all science was bad two years ago. Now I don't. And I feel like if we have a democratic limit to it, if we have a limit on the sp speed limit on the internet, we have a maximum size of social network, maybe a hundred people, whatever. Uh, we have, you know, get rid of Google Fiber. We have to have a maximum number of emails. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like if you limit those things, limit the number of hours that you look at your device, <laughs> is that possible? So we try to do that with TV. We try to be like no more than six hours a day or whatever. I yeah. Mean, in the 80s, we, if you limit those things, you basically can bring about this age of having a democratic counterbalance to the forces of capital saying, here's the new crack. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what you feel like we've, we've just tipped. It's not that we don't have any democratic forces at all. They just have cease to have the influence that they used to and so we're we're unable to i don't think there's democratic inputs on the internet or apps or silicon valley technology there's no democratic input on it you, you don't have to use facebook it's you the, can pro it's the product feet, right yeah, it's that, the product. that's that's the the common retort yeah, it's like well if you don't like our app you don't have to use it you know and it's like well sure. if all my friends are you're exploiting like innate human social pressures to to do this to me, right? Like it's yeah. it doesn't recognize. Well, you're not changing the direction of your groups of friends. It's not you know sure you cannot participate, but it's democracy as a product instead of a verb. Mm -hmm. It's like hey, you got everybody, and it's and and this is what uh, the Neil Postman book uh, "Amusing Ourselves to Death" talks about is that when it talks about moving from a literary society to a televised society and how television destroys everything, even when it's at its highest, most loftiest goals, it mm -hmm. makes it even worse. Like, you know what television's going to do in the 80s? It's going to fix politics. It's going <laughs> to televise the presidential debates. And all right. of a sudden, everyone's beautiful who's running for president. Yeah. Right? Same thing with the internet. And you know what the internet's going to do? It's going to fix politics. 
Right. It's going to make sure that there's polls everywhere and that there's, uh, you know, forum posts. It's just, you, you can't, there's no censorship. You can, you always find out about how people feel. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We're going to track voting records and make these just vitriolic Cowboys versus Broncos so tools and thoughts. Let's talk about, let's talk about ways forward. I mean, oh, sure. you've got a, you've got a few ideas. Um, I mean, my, my idea that I'm not really an idea, but just. I, I'm unsure if, if even verbalizing it is can do it justice, but it's like this this pull I feel mm -hmm. to be back in embodied work. Yeah, right? use your hands. The the, the, the Buddhist, Buddhist idea is like right livelihood. Mm -hmm. um, it's you know, the connection connection physically to. It is not work if you are, aren't using your body. Right. And you should work. right. You should work. Um, and the work ethic is uh, is is uh, you know slandered by uh, capitalism because it's like, hey, don't you want to just not work? Isn't yeah, exactly. Goal? We've been, and I love Illich's uh, analogy of the, the bread machine, right? right? Like, okay, what do you you, know, you used to uh, you know knead the dough right, and then right. you know put it in an oven, you know, let it rise and you slice it. Now you just like dump all the ingredients in a thing, push a button. Mm -hmm. Then okay, so what are you doing with that time? Yeah. That you want to spend making bread, you're just going over and pushing other buttons. You're checking email. Yeah. yeah, you're checking emails. You're yeah. You're and, and in fact, I, I would even <laughs> say that's that's uh, that's the other thing about why we stopped becoming a democracy and started be we stopped becoming a republic and started becoming a democracy where citizenry turned into consumers. Right. Right. We are not participating in our republic. We are not part we are not going to city hall, going to to, to a city capital building. Well, here's here's unless a, you are I okay. So here here's my personal experience. We are not arguing in community assemblies what we should do to respond to the flooding. Right. It's just being outsourced to our vote to uh, professionals. Yeah. We're we are not citizens anymore. We are consuming citizenship for Even ourselves. Watching the news, it felt like we were we we're sort of consuming the the like mm -hmm. uh, catharsis or or just tourism of the wound or something like that. Mm -hmm. I, I was out walking amongst the, the recent flooding we had here in Austin um, two mm -hmm. days ago. Mm -hmm. I have never seen so many people walking on random streets in Austin at the same time. To see for themselves. Ever in right. my life, talking to each other. Yeah. Neighbors coming out and like, the, it was so quiet. Everywhere was quiet. Yeah. Everyone was, was just sort of, we were all experiencing the same thing at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't think... I looked experience around... It all, experience it all together, as opposed to everyone getting an Amber Alert at the same time on their phone separately. Yeah, but yeah. Here, and here's what I saw still. Like, as much as people would sort of tentatively talk to each other, mm -hmm. it was like everyone was just sort of walking around in a daze. Nobody knew how to act. Yeah. Nobody knew what to do. It's atrophied. Right? Like, no... And I, I was just sort of in shock at both the horror of the disaster mm -hmm. itself, but also at our state of being as, mm -hmm. as, a, as a, you know, people in a city... Is we just, we just forgotten how to be a city. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, <laughs> everyone right. was either taking photos on their phone, on the phone talking to someone else, looking at their phone, or just yeah. like staring at the water. Yeah. Like that's those were the responses to this. <laughs> yeah, reality is mediated, and it's like, where is the? It was like it's like we're in a movie or something. <laughs> I know, it was yeah, kind of the feeling of like everyone <laughs> everyone was watching it as if it were this this entertainment or something. Yeah. Like, whoa, yeah, you yeah. know, it, it was it was. Deeply horrifying on, mm. on multiple levels. Yeah, we talk about positive ways forward. Um, mm. Yeah, I, yeah, sorry. I've been drawing, I've been drawing <laughs> like uh, objective correlative of cartoons where I have good conversations with people and then write down uh, things to draw cartoons about. And so one of them, you know, some of them from the other night, I was in San Francisco, mm. you know, put a giant fucking guillotine up in the uh, town square and just say, all right, give us some money, rich people. It's either that or the guillotine. You know, it's like, Ooh. It's, that's a good quote. Another is, uh, these are not the futures you're looking for. Mm. Kind of weird one, but it's and uh, it's a gift, Bill. You can't just give us ten billion dollars and say this is what it's for, right? You know, Bill for Bill Gates, but but a kind of better ones. I was uh, I was writing were like um, ideas for the future uh, to get out there, try and be positive. I'm very good mm. at being critical, and so here's a couple of them are um, sure communities make decisions, and it's just a bunch of people sitting around. You can't even see it. There's yeah. a bunch of people sitting around a, a table raising their hand. Uh, some of them are standing. So it's, that's really, that's what communities do, is communities make decisions. Mm. Huh. Another mm. one is uh, cities are public spaces. And it's got like a sub, you know, an elevated train and a the, city uh, hall. The, what's it, the Palazzo, the, sure. um, the Palazzo, or, uh, yeah. what is it called in Italy? Like the common, the sort of common squares. Yeah, the that Centro, are the Zocalo. Yeah, like, the, uh, what happened to those? Being sort of Public spaces went away. The commons got, yeah. got absorbed into land. So I, I love that. So um, these are public spaces. That's a, you just, I'm saying these are positive things you put out there. You put the stickers. Another one is uh, your neighbors are outside. 
This is people on a bike, standing in the street, someone sitting on a carpet on this, you know, with some food for people, someone with a dog, people sitting mm-hmm. on their stoop. These neighbors are outside. I'm just trying to like put that out there, being like, you that's where your neighbors are. Yeah. You want to talk to your neighbors? Let's go outside. They're, they're outside. Yeah. As opposed to at least in San Francisco, you're on a mailing list with them. Yeah. You know, you're on a Facebook all. group with them. Yeah, there's a Facebook group. Right. And it's all garage people who just come into the neighborhood and go into the garage from their dot com jobs and from sit inside and have things delivered. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Favorite. What's the point of fucking living in the city if you're not gonna go outside? Truth. So from my recent permaculture event, uh, grow food. Don't don't grow flowers. Grow food. Because yeah. it's it's food and also it's beautiful. I hear you, but <laughs> flowers are fucking important. Flowers are important for some things. Don't grow just flowers. Yeah. Grow food too. I think, I think some people can grow <laughs> I think some people can grow flowers. Because I think that if, even if they're growing flowers, first of all, bees. Yeah. Second of all, um, they're, uh, uh, flowers are important. Okay. They're just fucking important. Grow it's flowers a, and if, food. <laughs> it's important just to touch people, to have people touch the earth. But one of the, mm. you know, I was kind of in food politics a little bit in California, and one of my friends who's like runs a bunch of farmers or activist group, you know, uh, uh, farmers markets. And no, it's, just, it's more like farmers advocacy groups for uh, for legislation and stuff like that. She's saying we don't even say organic anymore. It's like who cares as long as it's fresh, right? It doesn't matter that it's organic. Like, mm-hmm. Eat a fresh peach as long as you're not drinking a peach snapple. Doesn't matter if it's GMO peach, whatever. Just Whoa. put a fresh fucking thing in your hand because otherwise you're like I make sure it's organic and biodynamic and hasn't been touched by a certain type of brown person. And it's just uh, you know. You're putting all these things on it to make it conspicuous consumption. To be right. like, I'm paying $3 for a peach at Whole Foods. Mm. As opposed to, just fucking find a peach tree and eat the peaches. Yeah. Like, get back in touch with touching things that are actually solid and have fiber in them. And, mm. I like that touch. Because we're not, oh, man, this is like the looping background for me. Tatsavam yeah. Asi. You are that. Like, you, you are that. That peach. Yeah. That was like, that was humans, like you're breathing air that has been breathed by all right. the animals and dinosaurs and humans that have ever existed, mm-hmm. and like you're not, you can't detach. As much as you feel like you want mm-hmm. to, you want to, you know, rapture your nerd self into the singularity. You are not separate from this. You are this. Yeah. You know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I would, I would say there's this improv book by Viola Spolin, and kind of the first paragraph she says, "We learn things with our own bodies." Mm. No one can teach any but you anything, and this is as true about a baby learning to crawl as it is a scientist looking through a telescope. It's like I can tell you what the stars look like. I can, and I would just follow that up with like YouTube. I think more learning happens uh, from having conversations with people than it does reading a book or seeing a YouTube. Okay, it's not po- it's possible to learn from a book. It's possible to learn from YouTube. It's, it's totally different kind great. of learning. It's different kind yeah, of learning. Yeah, but it's, we, uh, we don't have uh, the right words to distinguish. But yeah, it's different kind of learning. It's better. I mean, it's just it has a social it has a social uh, you know reward. It's creating something alive and a dialogue. It's a uh, it, it's it has a good feeling. It's not this dead thing that's just sitting there. Yeah, like, the carcass of language. Right? You can have a warehouse full of learning apps, but you can't have a warehouse full of real learning mm. unless it's like a bunch of people's bodies. Mm. <laughs> in it, in my opinion. Boy. Yeah. Um, well, we've we've gone all over the map. Uh, we're coming up on an hour here, I think. Um, yeah, we're gonna do it. Yeah, we're a little, little over. Time. So, Mark, this started. Can, at the, this is a uh, fifty-eight minutes. This 58. Is, uh, we started at three. Wow, perfect. It's it's tempting in a you know <laughs> li- linear, uh, delineated, finite format such as a podcast to like end up somewhere. Okay. And I, I'm guilty of always every episode trying to be like, what's the final word on this? You know, where do we feel like we are? And like. That that's sort of, I, I'm realizing more and more that like you, you get that from the, the whole the whole feeling of going through the, the podcast right. and every and every person is going to end up in a different place as a result of what they. I mean, I'm a writer. I sum up. Right? I just I just put a punchline at the end <clears throat> and try and summarize it. And basically, my summarization anyway Go. is that I worked on politics for the past twelve years and burned out. I don't think elections change anything. Maybe they raise the minimum wage. I think it's art. I think anybody listening to this, you need to go out. You need to make real art, art that asks questions, art that says something. If it doesn't do that, it's not real art. Um, all art is political, as George Orwell said. Even art that isn't trying to be, that is inherently, that is uh, purposely not political, that's still being political in a certain way mm. by being apolitical. And so everyone needs to just go talk to people, make fucking eye contact with people on the streets, interact with as many people as possible. Um, I have a tiny poem, maybe. Eh? About the about uh, what it's like in San Francisco again. This is a, 
the BART station, the subway station, I saw three empty bottles of champagne on the ground. I just thought, and I looked at it, it was Cook's Champagne, which is uh, quite cheap. Very low. And uh, I thought, wow, this is fascinating because, you know, we are all part of the Gilded Age. Three bottles of Cook's Champagne, everybody wants in on the Gilded Age. And all democracies have fallen, but the democracy of luxury, the wealth gospel, the optimist's bill of rights. Tony Robbins on the $20 bill, inviting you into the poorhouse where we can all be rich together. Silently tripping on golden coins of Thorazine, hospital gowns with no pockets. Only the very rich can get by with no pockets, and no wallets, and no pens, and no shoelaces, no way out. Thanks. Bad philosophy, everyone. Thanks for listening. Now, stop listening to this podcast and go do something Yeah. with someone. Make yeah. something beautiful. Yeah. H.L. Mencken says there's always a pen, there's always a piece of paper, there's always a way out. Unless there's no pen, there's no piece of paper. Cool. Thanks right. for being on the show, Mark. Hey, thank you, Steve. It was great. Yeah.